Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Ask Nick, my show where it's live and I cover everything uh, on leadership and business once a month. Um, today, my favourite topic, the three most common questions that I get asked by leaders. And the reason that these questions, in my view, are so important and the answers to them are so important are twofold. One, uh, we're all leaders, doesn't matter what you do, whether it's with your family, you're a leader. Whether it's with your circle of friends, you can be a leader. Whether it's with that sports club you're involved with or the community group you're part of, that volunteer organisation, you don't have to own a business or lead a team in a work sense to be a leader. So these questions and the answers to them apply to every aspect of life. And the second thing, of course, is this is the most important skill, what I'm about to cover. Um, for those of you that are following me, um, you would have seen an interview I put out on Friday with Mario Winans of Pickpock fame, Pickpock's uh, computer game making company down here in Wellington. Got about 130 people in their team and by New Zealand standards that's a very big team, that's a very big business. And Mario made the point that when he came out of university there was no, and entered KPMG, there was no training given at all by the university uh, or KPMG at the time around connecting with others, how to build relationships and 99% of success in any endeavour, whether it's your family, whether it's with a sports club or whether it's with a business, is people. 90% of my conversations are about people, about the team. Uh, another person that confirms this, one of my heroes, this guy here, Warren Buffett, he says that uh, the most important paper he's got, he's got three, he's got a graduate a, a graduate degree, post-grad degree, and a $100 Dale Carnegie course, and that's the most important piece of paper he reckons he's got, because he said that he knew that if he didn't know how to uh, connect with others and relate to others, he would never be successful. So what are the questions? Let's get going. Well, the first one, well, it seems quite simple, and yet I get asked it all the time, is what is the number one job of a leader? And the reason this question is really important, and I get asked it, is because when I start working with clients leading teams, they're working, I hate to use a cliche, they're working in the business, not on it. I talk about doing versus being. You know, they're working on all of the mechanics of the business, and they come and uh, find someone like me, we start working together, and of course, they want to move up to the point where they don't have to work in the business. So we get to that point, we get to the holy grail, we've got a leadership team, we've got the, the company running really well, the staff's doing really great things, and then uh, the leader says to me, well, what should I be doing all day? What is my job? So that's the first question, which I want to answer today. And the second question is about how do you get your team engaged? How do you get your team inspired to really go hard at whatever it is you're trying to do, whether it's a, a, a sports team trying to win a win a tournament or whether it's in the business, you're trying to achieve certain goals or take the business in a certain direction, how do you inspire others? And that's a really uh, interesting term because it's kind of fuzzy and opaque, so I want to cover that. And the last one is how would you measure your success? How do I know that I've actually achieved success as a leader? And while that might seem quite straightforward, um, uh, actually the answer that most people give me is not actually, in my view, the answer that you should do and it's not what I teach clients. So the first question, what's the number one job of a leader? You've got this team here, what should you be doing? Well, the ultimate outcome you're trying to create is that of trust, because when you get high levels of trust, three things happen. Firstly, people feel safe to tell the truth, to be honest about things, and that's a real fundamental key to success. And again, most teams that you'll be involved in, there's a lot of things that are unsaid that should be said. So. That's the first thing that happens when you get high trust. The second thing that happens, people feel safe to ask each other for help. And again, that's proven time after time to be one of the keys to high performance teams. And the third thing is, people feel safe to put their idea forwards. So safety, belonging and appreciation is what you're trying to create as a business leader or as a leader, full stop. And the first thing you're trying to do is make it safe. So how do you make it safe? Well you've got to connect with others, you've got to talk to people, and there are two conversations, in my view, in any team, and I view a team as nothing more than a network of conversations. So the easy conversation to have are what I call the spoken ones, and they're the ones that are comfortable to have. Hey, you've done a great job. Hey, uh, way to go. Hey, let's go for lunch, whatever it is. But the other conversations that run through like a little stream or thread through any organisation and team uh, what I call the unspoken conversations, which are the ones below the waterline, the rumours, the innuendo, the I'm not happy, and I get this all the time. I will literally get uh, one person from a team telling me something off the record, then another person from the same team telling me the opposite thing. Now, of course, my job and the business leader's job is to facilitate that conversation and get it on the table. So if you want to know what your job is as a leader, it's the, the number one thing you should be doing is facilitating what I call that unspoken conversation. 
Real easy example, poor performers. You cannot let a poor performer sit there and not be held accountable because one th well, two things are happening. One is they're working against you in the business, which is very, very bad, obviously, for your brand and your reputation. And brand and reputation are what people buy. They don't actually buy actual value. They buy perceived value, brand and reputation first. The second thing is that everybody else in your team is looking at you as a leader and asking themselves, well, hang on, this person said that these particular values are really important to our culture. You've got this poor performer over here. They're not living them or they're not hitting the numbers. I am. How is that fair? What are you going to do about it? Um, so that is the number one job of a leader because when you do that, you get uh, safety to tell the truth. You get safety to ask for help. You get people feeling safe to put ideas forward and you create trust. You get really, really connected. And you can have these conversations individually in your one-on-ones or just uh, as you're passing or you can have them in a team setting, either or. So that's the first thing. However, as you would have seen with Mario's interview and time after time with almost every leader I've ever come into contact with, there's a high degree of fear around having these conversations. So the second question is how do you become inspirational to others? Um, well, that tied in with the first one is what is my job? That is to have that unspoken conversation to create trust. But why don't people have that unspoken conversation? Well, it comes down to fear. So how do we overcome that? Well, the real key there is you must understand what your own fears are. And I've spent nine years doing this. And when I first started working with clients, and I still do, we, we've got a plan for the business. We have what's called a one-page execution plan, a strategic plan to take them from here to there over the next five to 10 years. And we spent a lot of time working on that. But what I figured out was in order to make that come true, I needed to have a plan for the individual, for the leader. So I now have what's called these personal leadership brand development plans. We'll talk about that later. And in those, one of those keys to those plans is what I call the spiritual, which is basically about being centered. And why is centered so, centeredness so important or calmness or inner peace? The reason that centeredness is so important and uh, it, it is because it's a key to inspiration. And there was a great bit of research done just uh, a year or so back where they surveyed a couple of thousand employees and said, look, what do you find inspirational in leaders? What characteristics or traits? And there were 32, but of those, they found one that was um, more, uh, I guess, common in the answer than any others, and that was this concept of centeredness. So how do you get centered? Well, you have to ask two questions. One is, what are my deepest fears? And they are one of three things, fear of failure, fear of rejection, or fear of conflict. And I was on the... Um, line uh, on line with a client this morning actually talking about fear of failure which comes from his particular childhood and uh, his upbringing so you first of all have to say what are those fears and second of all you have to ask where do they come from usually they come from a childhood zero to 14 um, often from our parents or other people that were significant influences in our lives and then you need to talk about it with someone now this process can take uh, sometimes months sometimes years for some people um, but you need to go get someone. I mean, that's a part of the role that I play with clients. Someone that's a confidant that you can talk about this stuff with. I have uh, world champions of their sports who are now in the business field talk, talking to me about all this kind of stuff, their deepest fears and where they come from. And what you'll find is when you do that, they tend to disappear or they tend to greatly diminish and you become very calm and very even and very centered, which is what people find inspiring. And most importantly, you become free of fear, so you don't worry about conflict, you don't worry about rejection or failure, because you've dealt with your deepest fears, and then you can walk into the unspoken conversation, which you need to have in order to create trust. So see, it all links together, and it's actually quite marvelous when you see this, when someone goes through this change and you see them come out the other side. Um, and the third question, which I mentioned at the start, is how do you measure all this? How do you know if you've been successful or not? And of course, most people would say, well, in business sense, it's profitability or it's revenue. And yes, while that is true, you need to look at those numbers. There are two other key numbers that have the biggest impact on those numbers. Um, so a CEO uh, in a longitudinal study shows that the CEOs account for about 15% of a company's performance for better or worse. Um, so if you're a CEO or a leader, you're going to need to make sure that you measure how you're going. And the two key performance indicators, I believe, that every leader should look at is one around their team and one around their uh, customers. So the first thing, let's start with the team. How do you know if your team's engaged? Well, there's a really great um, survey you can do called the Gallup Q12. It is 12 questions asking uh, your team members to rate the business or, or their team 
on these 12 uh, variants. And you get the data back and you can drill down on the areas where you're not doing so well, go back to your team and you can make changes. And the clients that have been with me for many, many years have seen their Q12 scores just increase, increase, increase. They conduct them once or twice a year. If you want to know more about that, again, go to my website, nickharvey.online, type in the question there, and I'll, I'll explain to you how you can do that. So that's the first metric. And it, and it tells you if someone's engaged, disengaged, or actively disengaged. The second metric I think all leaders should look at is how are their customers rating the experience of their product or brand or service? So um, the best uh, survey I like to use is the Net Promoter Score. Some of you will be familiar with that. It's a question that was developed by a guy called Carl Reichheld. Again, research-based. And the question is, on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to recommend your business product or service to a friend or family member? If someone gives you a 9 or 10, that's awesome. They're promoters, and they are just over 60% likely to reuse you and just over 60% likely to recommend you. So that's both retention and growth. How great is that? But here's the interesting thing. This, anybody gives you a seven or eight, they're only 16% likely to reason and recommend you. So we get a, if we get an eight out of 10, we think we're doing well, but those people are just likely to go down the road to your competitor as they are to come back to you. The good news is that you can sway a seven or eight and turn them into a nine and 10. And the final group, zero to six, is the detractors, and they are 0% likely to reuse and recommend you. And the second question you should be asking if you decide to do this is what is the reason for the score you just gave? So you can uh, group the answers for the promoters and see what the trend is there, what do they love? The passives, those sevens and eights, those neutrals, see what they're saying and see if we can improve that to get them to be a nine and 10. And the zero to sixes just stop doing whatever they don't like. So those are the two key metrics that will tell you what you're doing. Now to wrap all of this up, you do need to have um, a plan around this. So how do you do this? Well, I'm actually rolling out a workshop uh, next, uh, what is it, next month, uh, Thursday the 27th from nine to noon. Uh, that's gonna be with the ANZ in Hamilton, and that's gonna be on what I call your personal development brand. And that's around the four areas uh, that I have developed over the years with clients that I think if you nail these four areas, it makes you a well-rounded human being, which makes you an awesome leader. And they are around the physical, the spiritual, the relational, and the financial. And you need a plan for the next three to five years, going right back to your daily routine to execute on that. So if you want to get better at um, facilitating that spoken conversation, if you want to deal with your deepest fears and you want to um, make sure those metrics of uh, team engagement and customer satisfaction are whether you want to, where you want them to be, you need a plan. And here's the key with the plan is it's about forming new habits. And a guy called Roy Baumeister, who's a uh, psychologist or, or social science researcher, if you like, in the US, done a lot of research over the decades. He did a bunch of research into willpower. And he found that willpower is a little bit like a battery and that we've all got so much willpower and it runs out over the day. And once you've used it up, you got no more. So an example of that might be you, you want to go to the gym at the end of the day, but you work really, really hard. You use your willpower up. At the end of the day, you're like, ah, I'm too tired. I won't go. Next minute, you haven't gone. The difference between leaders that execute really well on these three questions and, and, and those that don't is just simply that they have developed better habits. And so those habits require less conscious energy and drain your willpower battery a lot less. And so uh, I haven't got time today to give you how to go through that plan. It's a three-hour workshop. Um, I'm going to roll the rest of them out around the country, so look forward to it. But if you want to learn, if you want to develop and grow as a leader, you do need a plan for yourself around the four areas. Physically, you need to be very, very uh, fit and healthy. Uh, spiritually, that's the centered bit. That's dealing with your deepest fears. You've got to have a plan to work through those. Uh, financially, you've got to have a really good financial plan in place. And uh, there's a really good book called uh, The Barefoot Investor for your, your beginner, if you're a beginner uh, person in terms of money. Um, and the last thing um, is uh, relationally. How do we act, interact with other people? And uh, that involves your family, uh, that involves your loved ones, and that obviously involves your colleagues and your customers and the people you work with. So if you've got any questions around this, make sure you let me know. But um, I'm really, really interested to get your feedback on how you go with facilitating an unspoken conversation. You know, what are your deepest fears and how do they affect you with your behaviour and uh, the way that you interact and connect with others? And finally, do you measure any of this stuff?
because it's no good saying I'm a great leader or I'm not a great leader and you actually measure how effective you are at that. So yeah, go out there um, today and make sure, most importantly, that you be interested versus be interesting. And uh, again, if you've got any questions, fire them into me and have a super fantastic day.